All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here with us for another edition of The Global Reality. I'm your host, Josh Reeves. This is the Wednesday, August 30th, 2017 edition of the broadcast. Again, want to thank everybody for being here yet again, tuning in for another show. It's always, uh, you know, I, I <laughs> that's one thing about me. I, you know, I can always, there's so much. I, I used to really rely on, on uh, in the, you know, early in the show, in the years of the show, I'd rely heavily on, you know, news and, and, and whatever else. But at this point, man, I, you know, and we do have some news to cover, and we'll probably get into some here tonight. But I, I've been enjoying how I've just kind of been, you know, peppering some news in here and there and focusing just on talking about topics. Uh, it's more enjoyable for me that, that way. But I also like doing the news, too, especially, when, you know, stuff that ties in with other uh, other things we've discussed in previous shows. You know, there's we've covered a lot of ground here in the past 10 years. <laughs> I tell you, I've, I've covered a lot of subjects. Uh, but, you know, there are sometimes there are subjects that I, you know, haven't talked about a lot. And, uh, you know, a couple of nights ago when I talked about the Tupac stuff, that was just something I, you know, I had a question about it. Somebody asked me, I, even though I, you know, I had re- really just said recently I probably wasn't going to put anything in the film on that. Now I'm looking at there may be a little bit, you know, a little bit of Tupac stuff. They're not the full tilt boogie that I'm going to do when I make a, I'm going to make a mini film, you know, kind of like I did with the Bowie series, the, uh, um, well, what was the name of that? Secret Messages, the Secret Messages series. Uh, which, by the way, you can get the version that's on uh, YouTube is just the you know the standard definition version. If you want to see the full thing with both parts one and two uh, edited together, you can get that in our download shop and in HD, and that's that's the best way to see that. That's a really if you've never seen that series, you should go back and watch that. That's some of the most. Uh, what's incredible about that series is that part one that I did. People have made tons of those Bowie, Bowie videos and stuff now, but I, I had mine out exactly one week to the day of his death. And if you watch that and you realize how much research is in that, that's not something anybody else but me, literally not, not a boast, not anything like that, not me being you know boastful or you know egotistical or anything. Um, that's really something else nobody could have put together in that way like I did in in a week because I I had already studied that stuff and had already had such a it was like as soon as it was like it was just right in my wheel that very rarely happens very rarely does there you know otherwise if it, if it if it happened if it could happen all the time you'd be seeing me taking videos like that every time something happens or every time there's a you know eventful thing thing in the news or whatever like Bowie's death was but I, I just had known all the a lot of that stuff already, and it was so right in my wheelhouse. And every there was so much weirdness surrounding it, and the in the just the iconography and everything I was already familiar with. And I'd already, you know, as being a student of not only you know all this information and stuff, also I'm a, you know been a student for of music for just as many years. You know, being a musician and playing, you know, I play every instrument, not every instrument, but I, you know, I can play a lot of different instruments fluently. I mean, I've been in every, put it to you like this, I've I've been in every, pretty much every position. I don't think I've ever been just the lead guitar player in a band, although I was, a, you know, a singer, a guitar player. I did play, I was the only guitar player, so I played the leads and stuff. But So I guess you technically could say I've played every position in a band. I've been a singer. Uh, I've been a, you know, a guitar player. I've been a bass player. I've been a keyboard player. I've been a drummer. Um, and, uh, so, you know, Bowie, that was something that I think was kind of right, right in my wheelhouse. But, you know, I've never I've never done a lot of shows talking about the whole Tupac thing. But uh, after I got a question about it, and it's, again, the other night, you know, just decided to talk about it because it is something I know a lot about. And I probably know just as much. I, literally, a lot of people have been shocked by this. It's, it's kind of interesting. Um, I've got a lot of comments and emails and stuff about I didn't think it would set people on. You, just, you know, that's the thing with <laughs> That's the thing with this stuff. You just never know what's going to set people on fire, you know. Sometimes the things you, you think, I mean, because I still can't believe that people have been chirp, chirp, quiet on the whole L. Ron Hubbard uh, or Georgia Guidestones thing. If you ever saw that video, go look it up on YouTube. With me. I mean, I just still can't believe how many people have been quiet on that. We, you know, 
the whole thing's been blown open, but people are still trying to be quiet about it. But I didn't think anybody would really respond, but a lot of people responded both positively and negatively. Uh, believe it or not, there's still a lot of people out. I, I don't know. I, you know, there's just a lot of, uh, I don't want to say outright racist, but you know, there's, a, there's still a lot of people out there that, I don't know. They have, they, they think that, uh, I don't know. They have certain, I don't know. They, it, it's expectations or I don't really know what it is. Put my finger on it, but fuck all those people anyway. Um, I'm going to talk about what I want to talk about when I want to talk about it. If you don't like it, you can eat a dick and the surefire way, uh, to make me be on fire about a subject is to have a problem with it. That's, you know, and that was when I was on to the, to the CMP stuff. If people would have just been like, okay, cool, man. Yeah. Yeah. This is, you know, this, this is important stuff. All right, cool. Right on. I probably would have still you know, been just as into it and into researching it. But when I immediately out of the gate started getting, you know, getting a lot of uh, knee jerk responses and stuff like that and deny, I mean, right out of the gates when I first started talking about that stuff, that's when, I mean, that's when I knew I was onto something. Um, you know, and the Tupac thing too, there's, as I've talked about, it's one of those subjects that uh, has gotten a lot of coverage. And there's a lot of disinfo out there. There's a lot of stuff parading his truth, a lot of stuff that sounds plausible. And um, so, yeah, I am going to make a little mini film, you know, not a, a, middle, a mini film on, on Tupac at some point with all the information as I see it and as I've pulled it together. Because I don't think anybody's quite put, I mean, everybody, there's a lot of good pieces out there. You know, there's a lot of people, there are people who don't, um, come from the he faked his death standpoint but come from the he was murdered standpoint that have a lot of factual information that, that I agree with 100% but you know I separate from them at at when you start looking at the data of you know as I talked about the other night all the just all the strange stuff. I didn't even mention the uh, you know the the botched all the stuff on the death certificate him weighing like you know 70 80 more pounds than then uh, he actually weighed and being like, I'd be like six foot two. Pac was like five, eight or something. He wasn't, you know, it was no six foot two brother. He would look at, look, look at the pictures uh, with him and Suge Knight. Suge Knight is six, two. Okay. So any of the pictures you see with Suge Knight and, and Tupac, Tupac is considerably shorter than him, but on his death certificate, it says he was six foot two and, the if you enter Tupac's social security number, social security number listed on the death certificate into the uh, social security uh, death r database, it, nothing comes up. Because again, Shug Knight even said himself, he said it multiple times in multiple interviews, and he was not joking around. He said it multiple times. Why do you think I paid three million dollars to the guy that supposedly cremated Tupac, and nobody ever saw him again after that? He's like, ask yourself that. Ask yourself how he was able to record all those songs when it's mathematically impossible he could have recorded all that many songs that you've seen still coming out with his name on it. And uh, that's the interesting thing about this subject is there you've got multiple simultaneous truths that are all valid at the same time. You know what I mean? Whereas most topics, you know, you have something where you know, something like 9-11 where there's you know, really only one honest to goodness truth about how it happened and everybody thinks they've got it and got it figured out, but really nobody does. It's all speculation. And what one um, conclusion might be might be true and one other one might, might not be, but with uh, might, not, might, might not be, and you speak. Uh, but the uh, thing with the Tupac thing is that You've got I me mean, again. You could you could uh, do all the research and all of the investigation up to the point, and come to the conclusion that you know, yes, indeed, he was set up and murdered, and it wasn't just a you know some random gang drive-by bullshit or whatever East Coast West Coast bullshit or anything. 
it was much deeper than that. And, um, you know, you would be true. But then also there's the, you know, the end of it that, un, I mean, unquestionably, when you look at the evidence of him faking his death, it's, I mean, it's just, it's there in spades, the whole helicopter thing, the video he made with the helicopter. I mean, the, some of the last videos that he did, that Machiavelli record, especially Machiavelli, you know, uh, he, which was, I mean, he even put on there, that was a record that came out, was made before he died, but he quite, first one to come out afterwards, but that was, he was clearly showing you uh, that that's what it was. I mean, he even says, it says, enter Machiavelli, uh, exit Tupac. It says that on the record, he's crucified on there. And of course, the name of the, Everybody always calls it the the Machiavelli record, which it is. But see, that he was changing his name. He was becoming, he was killing Tupac and becoming another character. And the other character is the one that went, and, you know, allegedly went and lived, has gone and lived in Cuba with his aunt, who also fled there from the CIA and from. She's still on, you know, uh, I guess the only woman on the America's Most Wanted list. So, of course, the album is called uh, Machiavelli the Don. Or actually, th that's the title that he's going by. So, Tupac, he's going by Machiavelli the Don. But the name of the album, everybody always calls it the Machiavelli. And the actual name of the album, and I've, I've seen this a lot, and at first I thought it was just kind of a, a you know, a mistake or, or something. But the name of the album is actually Killuminati. Instead of Illuminati, Killuminati. And there's an interview with Tupac, where he, I saw the interview, I think, where he discusses this, and supposedly, I think it came from, like, either his actual last interview or one of the last interviews, but either way, it was just, like, two weeks or maybe not even that long before he was killed. Um, but he says in his own words that the reason he called, he, he came up with that phrase, kill Illuminati, is that when he was in uh, prison, and that's another thing we'll talk to him in all these cases and stuff that he all had. He was set up on all of these cases. They were continually trying. I mean, you know, they shot the guy five, five fucking times, man, and he didn't die. I mean, you want to talk about hard as fuck. They shot him twice in the head. They shot him like in the chest. They shot him through the, this is before the Vegas thing. Um, and they shot him through the hand and it went through his hand and went into his leg and severed his, uh, I think it's a femoral artery, one of those. And, I mean, he's, like, shot up, bleeding out. And they're hauling, there's a picture. You can actually see the actual picture. They're hauling, uh, it's supposed so fucking hard. They fucking, they're hauling him away into the ambulance. And somebody's there with a camera to take a picture. And what's he doing? Shot five times. He throws the motherfucking middle finger up, dude. Still. I mean, it's just, it's just unbelievable. But, uh. He had uh, been in, in prison, and while he was in prison for this supposed sexual assault thing that he didn't do, uh, he says that the, the brothers in there were telling him about the Illuminati. And it's interesting what he says, because he said, he, he said that he changed it to kill Illuminati because the Illuminati is, he said that that's just a, I'm trying to remember the exact terminology he used. He said, that's like, basically, that's just like another excuse or just another way to, you know, he's kind of right. He had a great point there because, you know, it is another way to put, that's, I've talked about this many times. I call it the chill factor. And that's what a lot of these um, so-called truthers and so-called radio hosts and so-called researchers and whatnot, um, and a lot, some of them are slick. They'll do it in a way where you, you where it kind of seems like they're still kind of trying to be positive, but they use a lot of this stuff to, for the chill factor. And a lot of that stuff actually comes from the Freemasons have, have done that for years. The many, much of the propaganda that's come out about Freemasons, about them being Satan worshipers and, and all this stuff, um, has come from within their organization. Just like I was talking about last night, though, you know, keeping the, the sacred knowledge and secret knowledge from the profane and only having you know, certain people to have it. And so Tupac in this interview says, you know, basically the whole Illuminati thing is another way to keep you down. But he says something interesting after that. He says, and you got to remember, this is like maybe a, maybe two weeks, maybe a week, maybe, I don't know how, maybe shorter than that, maybe a couple of days, even very shortly before he, before he supposedly died. 
And he says, he basically says something about, yeah, how's some brother in, in prison going to know that somebody's coming to kill me or something. I mean, how, who, who's, who, whose source is, is he, you know, who, who's, how's somebody in the Illuminati coming to tell this dude? And I had never heard him say that. And I heard that recently and it blew me away. He, he, so he, he's kind of, you know, slanging it up and it's kind of not a very good recording. You kind of have to listen to it a few times to hear what he's saying. You can look it up. I think it's on YouTube. It's, I think it's entitled Tupac's last interview or something like that. But if you look that up, look it up, you can hear it. And he's talking about the brothers telling him about the Illuminati when he was in prison. And that, you know, the, the, he felt like Illuminati was just another way to, you know, to scare people, keep people down, whatnot, you know, the whole thing of that. But he also says that some dude in prison told him that he was going to be, that the Illuminati put a hit out on him, he's going to be murdered. And I just thought that was interesting. So he gets out of prison and that's, you know, he starts recording these songs. And I think it's only like a very, you know, very short time, maybe a couple more weeks until he supposedly was killed. But um, the person, I was going to mention some, I remember the other night I, I said I had forgotten to mention some stuff when I was talking about the Tupac stuff on, on Monday night. Um, and I remembered what those things were that I didn't mention because I was talking about the movie All Eyes on Me. Um, I, I mentioned that if you go to watch that movie and you download, if you're somebody that downloads stuff from BitTorrent or something, um, be aware that there are a lot of versions of that movie, and this is what's interesting, and this also happened with the, uh, I guess it was last year when it came out, and it's interesting because it ties in with Suge Knight and all that, but there was, uh, the same thing happened with the Straight Outta Compton movie that came out last year. There were tons of uh, copies going around on BitTorrent. Very strange, very mysterious, and I, I, it came on my radar, and I thought it was odd at the time. Didn't really think about it again until recently, but there were a lot of versions of that movie going around on BitTorrent that someone had edited certain key see scenes out of. And I, I saw one of those versions, and I remember going, what the fuck is... I mean, it just seemed odd. I was like, wait a minute here. Nobody, nobody in Hollywood, in a Hollywood movie, would let a movie go out this sloppily edited, you know, where you're like bouncing. It, something it didn't seem right. And then, of course, I found out that's that was true. And sometimes what happens is... Um, Specifically in China, I guess a, a lot of the uh, sort of, you know, cam, what they call cam shot movies or whatever, uh, a lot of them come out of China, and China censors movies and edits them before they even get shown in the theaters over there. So, but it's also, I guess, e maybe easier over there. I know a lot of them come out of Russia, too. Um, but supposedly these countries, I guess it's just easier to get away with videoing it. So they a lot of times they'll video these movies using a phone or a you know, hidden camera or something and then they'll have somebody go in with a little small recorder and get the you know the audio the english audio and then they'll sync it up or whatever and i i, I noticed I, I noticed i watched one version of the tupac movie and um shit jumped around wildly like out of order wildly i went wait a minute here And they're, talk they're talking to someone here who's like, wait, we didn't even see why they would be talking about what they're talking about right now. That does doesn't make any sense. At first, I thought maybe this is why uh, that movie got so, I mean, it's like one of the worst reviewed movies I've seen on uh, Rotten Tomatoes ever, which is really, their rating is, their shit's bullshit, just like anything else. There's tons of good movies that don't get good ratings on, on uh, Rotten Tomatoes, but... Uh, I, I, that was the other thing I was going to mention the other night, too, was that I talked about that with, with movies, uh, tons of different movies. I mentioned, I think, the last one a few months ago was the that Tom Cruise mummy movie or whatever. I always get interested to watch certain movies that look like they're probably pretty good movies, and then you see when they come out or whatever, and, and, and all the reviews, you just see uh, across the board, bad reviews, across the board, bad ratings. But yet, these movies look like they probably might be okay. If you just, it's just odd, you know? And then you'll see other movies that'll get across the board, great reviews, five-star, and you're like, you watch it, and you're like, that's a shit movie, like Inception? Ugh. That was one of the fucking worst movies ever made. But it got fucking great reviews across the board. All the fucking, you know, some, I mean, just uh, unanimous r rave reviews across the board, and then you watch it, and it's a shit movie. And then you see other things that get these unanimous 
shitty reviews across the board, and you watch them, you're like, wait, and then you, uh, almost every time, I'm not saying 100% of the time, but like 98% of the time, there's like some hard info in there. And so, that's again, that's what was interesting about that Tupac, the new Tupac biopic that's out. It's called All, All Eyes on Me, but make, make sure if you look it up, you spell it uh, E-Y-E-Z. you got to spell it hood, or otherwise it won't come up. Uh, <laughs> Uh, E-Y-E-Z. It's just, you don't have to put Tupac in. It's just called All Eyes on E-Y-E-Z. All Eyes on Me. You look at that. And uh, anyway, if you're somebody who does download movies from BitTorrent or whatever, just a word of the wise, make sure you only download one uh, if it says uncensored. Make sure you only download them because there are, a lot, there are copies going around. And it's interesting. Once I discovered this, I went back and said, okay, once I got the actual version and watched it and... Uh, then, of course, it went, okay, now I get it. I, I see why. They, but then, this is the other thing that, that caught my attention because this can't really be a coincidence. I, I don't believe this is a coincidence because the, the, one of the scenes that was cut out uh, applies to this. It, it it's concerns this individual. Um, and you don't hear a lot about this guy. And he's, in, he's integral to the whole, uh, the whole Tupac story, especially in terms of uh, a lot of these court cases and stuff that came out and him getting shot as well, both, both connected to this guy. Um, here's two names I want to give you, the first of which is the one we're going to talk about now. But if you're going to do some independent research of your own on the whole Tupac thing, here's two names you, you need to write down that are import, very important to the whole thing. Uh, the first one is David Kenner. David Kenner, K-E-N-N-E-R, David Kenner. And the second one is Haitian Jack. And Haitian Jack's the one we're going to talk about. Now, now, the thing about this movie is that if you're somebody who is kind of a casual fan or somebody who just kind of likes to, you know, somebody who really hasn't ever really delved into the research there are things, as I said the other night, there are things in the movie that movie's going to go over a lot of people's heads, and I think this is probably why it got bad reviews, because, again, there are blatantly fucking obvious mistakes in this film, but then there are clear clues in there also. And to me, these clues are so overt in the film, and one of these clues was what I was talking about, was edited out of whatever the version I saw was, um, but there was this guy named, I think his name was Jacques, Jacques Agnet or Jacques Agne, or I, I don't know. Anyway, for, uh, from Haiti, uh, Haitian Jack, supposedly they're making a, the same guy who directed the Tupac All Eyes on Me movie supposedly has a TV series, miniseries in the work. I don't know whether it's a documentary miniseries or whether it's going to be an actual, uh, you know, a, a movie, live action movie like the All Eyes on, on Me film. I don't really know at this point. I haven't really looked that much into it. But it is in the works. Um, anyway, in the movie, All Eyes on Me, they don't refer to this character as Haitian Jack, not even once. They call him, I can't remember what they call him, they call him something else. Um, but you first see him on the scene, in a nightclub scene in the movie, and some guy's bringing him like a suitcase full of cash, and he's like, get that money out of here. And he's like, let me see what's going on over here. And uh, It's Tupac's wearing like some red, like, uh, it's like red leather, red red gator, or something. I don't know. He's wearing something. He's talking to to, to Notorious B.I.G. and he he says, "Hey, you know, bring my boy some crystal over here. You know, hey, anything you need, you know, I, I got you, whatever." And uh, that's his introduction into it. And then the next, it's kind of interesting because even though it was a big amount of time between this, it made me wonder if there was stuff that was originally written that they cut out of the movie because you see Tupac get introduced to to Haitian Jack. And again, they call him something else. I can't remember the name they call him in the movie. But I, I even know a lot about the about this case. I had to go and pause the movie and go and find out who this guy was. Because I never heard, in all my years, I'd, whatever they were calling him, I'd never heard of somebody with that name connected to 
the whole Tupac thing. And then when I went and found out, oh, it's Haitian Jack, well, why the fuck didn't they call him Haitian Jack in the movie? Well, there's there's a good reason why they didn't. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, so, in the movie, the uh, it, 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 there had to have been something else that was written there because it cuts from, and I'm not sure exactly how much time is is in between this, may have been a very short period of time. I'm not really for sure. But he was in New York, and he was shoot at the time when all this stuff when it happened, and he met Haitian Jack, and he was there with Notorious B.I.G. at the club. And he was in New York filming the movie Above the Rim. And um, so it goes from the nightclub scene to another, to, the, to just a quick edit right out of the club, no in-between, just right out of the club to right there on a movie set, and they're in New York. And you can tell some time has passed. And I did a little research, and apparently uh, Tupac was basically hanging out with this Haitian Jack guy and his crew uh, while he was there in New York filming Above the Rim. And there's a scene where Haitian Jack gives Tupac um, a Rolex, his first Rolex or whatever. And um, I guess right about that time, Biggie Smalls is, like, walking up and uh, he says to Tupac, "Hey man, you you know you and you and that guy are are y'all getting kind of close, huh?" And he's like, "No, oh, man, you know we're just hanging out, whatever. You know he's a cool cat, whatever." And uh, the tourist Big says to him, "I don't know, man. It's a serious cat. You know, be careful." And then it was, it was, it's interesting because then again, you see later, you know he's he's like with him and whatnot, but they kind of like use innuendo and. But when you're watching that movie, watch the scene specifically with this Haitian Jack guy in it and watch what's going on because it, it, it really is. They're really trying to tell you some real truth there. And you have to dig in and find out who this guy is because they don't call him Haitian Jack or Jack at all or Jacques or whatever. They call him a different, completely different name. Again, that's why even me, somebody who knows about this case, when I was watching the movie, going, who is this guy? I thought it was some fictionalized character at first. But you can see that that Right whenever Tupac gets introduced to this guy, this is when everything starts to go downhill. And remember, at, at this time, him and, and Notorious B.I.G. and all that, they were all friends. He was still, he helped, I mean, he gave Notorious B.I.G. his whole career, Tupac did. I mean, that's why he was so pissed. Because, you know, here's uh, Tupac's hanging out with this Haitian Jack guy. and. Uh, there's a scene where he offers him some blow. Now, this is key to understanding who this Haitian Jack guy is and why this turns into And I see him, he offers him, he's like, no, I don't want any of that. And there's some girl that um, Haitian Jack introduces Tupac to. And so they're at a club. She ended up uh, sucking his dick, like, on the dance floor. They had sex one time or something, and that was it. And then, like, the next day, and they depict this in the movie, she like gives him a back rub and she's trying to get him, you know, and he doesn't want anything to do with it. And he goes to sleep and then he wakes up and she comes in and starts screaming that her story was is that they like raped her in the ass, like two or three of them, even though, you know, no, there, she had medical examinations done on it. And there was none of that that was ever found by any doctor. Anything happened. And the time between when, and they depict this in the movie, I'm glad they did because this, this is, comes from reports I've heard. I think even Tupac even said something about it. Said the cops were just there too fast. It was like she comes out screaming, comes in there screaming, and, and he's like, well, I didn't do it. And she's like, you're not, this isn't the last you heard from me. You know, you could just tell, you could tell this is a setup. They were setting him up. They were setting up Tupac for this. And uh, so he goes out like downstairs, and with as he goes downstairs, the cops are already there. I mean, this is like, we're talking in New York. We're talking in minutes. I mean, if somebody just claimed with no evidence that someone has sexually assaulted them, I mean, even if you called 911, it's not, it's going to take forever. This is, they had, there was like 10 cops down there waiting for these guys. They, they knew it was happening. And then when it came to go to court, and they show this in the movie, Haitian Jack gets uh, severed and has the ability, gets the ability to have his case this rape case tried separately but 
there never came any other information about it. And he, the guy says, how could he do that? Tupac says that to his lawyer. Well, how could he? He's like, powerful friends in powerful places. And, you know, so Tupac really, and they, I mean, they called him a, you know, a, an ass raper. And it was all in the, in the media that he was, they called him a rapist. That, I mean, people thought for like a year, that was, even though it finally came out and he, he got, what he got to was un, uh, 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 essentially amounted to unlawfully touching somebody's butt. That was the final charge. And they sent him in to maximum security prison, like where he was in there with lifers and murderers and stuff. So this is the first, this is where you can first start to see that, um, you know, that this was going on. So, so it, anyway, he's having his case and the, the court the case gets drawn out for a while. And, uh, before he ends up getting sentenced, he's talking about on TV, and there's actual video footage of of that event where he's saying, "You know, this is not fair. You know, where where are these other guys at that were supposedly involved in this? I'm the only one that's being put on trial for this, and meanwhile, these guys, there, there's, I'm not the only one who's involved in this yet. We're hearing nothing about their trials or anything they're getting." So clearly, this Haitian Jack guy was was connected to somebody, and now it's come out that yes, indeed, he has he had connections to not only the FBI. Haitian Jack was also 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 working with the CIA. Um. So again, at that time, you know, the whole East Coast West thing was not really popping off. In fact, they were working together, and what doesn't get widely reported is that uh, Tupac was even he was working to end the feud between the Bloods and the Crips and was bringing together gangs and ending gang violence. I mean, you got to understand, this is a big problem for people like Al Sharpton and others, people who have been, whose whole lives and livelihood are, are revolving around all of this, you know, all of this stuff. And you have somebody like Tupac that comes along and, and has the power to start ending all this stuff. He was even coming out with an East Coast, West Coast, you know, rap album that was going to come out, uh, but then he you know, was allegedly killed. So they, they show a scene in the movie where Haitian Jack's like with these gangster guys counting money. We don't know that it happened like this, but it, it's a pretty good approximation, I think. And then uh, he basically says, well, all of this, this rape stuff is to blame on hangers on. And then Haitian Jack hears him saying that on TV, and he's like, oh, oh I'm a hanger on now, huh? And uh, one of his crew says, you know, we need to kill this motherfucker. And he's like, hey, no, no you're not doing anything. You don't do a fucking thing unless I say you do something and I'm not telling you to do anything. And you see two guys motion like, okay, well, let's go and get them. And that's when the event happened when he was shot. And he was shot at this recording studio where Notorious B.I.G. and Puff Daddy and all those guys were up, up there recording. They knew he was coming there. And he was ambushed, shot five times. And uh, Biggie and Tupac, I mean, Biggie and, uh, and fucking Puff Daddy were just standing there just staring at him. While he shot, that really happened. They depict that in the movie. Then some, a little bit of time passes, I guess a few weeks, and he, he he checks himself out of the. Here's another interesting. He go, so he goes to the hospital after being shot, right at the recording studio. That's when he flipped off the camera. He's in there. He has surgeries. And then they show this scene in the movie. This is very. This is another one of those little truthful things they dropped in this movie. That's very interesting. You see him in the hospital, and he's talking to his mother in the hospital, and he's got these, a bunch of these black guys. He's in New York. He has a bunch of these black guys. He, they never identify to you who these guys are. I've looked up and tried to do some research and find out who these guys are. Presumably, they're, they were a part of the New York crew that was um, providing security to Tupac while he was in New York. But where were they when he got shot? You know, there was none of that security around when he got shot. That's why... You see him, and he's in the hospital, and he tells his mom, it was a setup. You know, this, this was a setup. Well, you see Notorious B.I.G.'s coming into the hospital trying to visit him, but they won't let him in. There's like five or six big, you know, security-looking, big, mean-looking brothers uh, wearing suits and wearing bow ties. And that immediately, because, you know, and they're pushing Biggie away, and they won't let Biggie in to see Tupac. And at that again, at that point, there wasn't any beef yet, but East Coast, West Coast beef or any beef between um, 
but he started figuring out, oh shit, that's why B.I.G. and Puffy didn't do anything when I was shot. And they were just kind of standing there. They were they were in on. It. They knew they knew this was going to happen or something. So these guys and the brothers in bow ties like won't let Notorious B.I.G. in to see Tupac. This is all in the movie. Um, now what that immediately as soon as I saw that I went, holy shit, that's another clue. Because if you remember, if you go and look up the description of the guy, the eyewitness that I multiple eyewitnesses saw shoot. Um, Notorious B.I.G. six months later after uh, <coughs> Tupac was shot uh, the second time when he was allegedly killed in, in Las Vegas the guy the eyewitness descri- account is a black guy wearing a bow tie now when you go look up him and you go look, uh, look up that up look up Fonsworth Bentley F-O-N-Z W-O-R-T-H who was Fonsworth Bentley Fonsworth Bentley was was Puffy's personal assistant that always wore a bow tie. And if you look at the I mean, if you look at the description, how many brothers wear bow ties? I mean, come on. Um you look at the if there's a police sketch drawing, and if you look at the police sketch drawing, you'll look at pictures of Fonsworth Bentley, it's that same motherfucker. So who were these guys in bow ties? Because they're there in New York. They're guarding Tupac's room. And then they won't let Biggie Smalls in, even though there wasn't a problem at that point. Now, if these guys were the New York guys that were, that were given Pac security while he was there, they would have known there wasn't any beef between Notorious B.I.G., and they would have let him in there. Why didn't they? Because these guys were part of perpetuating this stuff. When he, after he uh, goes to trial, after he gets shot, he goes to trial and ends up being put in prison for, you know, a while for supposedly touching this woman's butt or whatever. That's the charge they can make if they dropped it down from rape. He's going out in the yard while he's in prison and some brothers got like a ghetto blaster or something out in the yard and they're playing Notorious B.I.G. And I can't remember uh, the name of the song. Yeah, the name of the song was Here Comes Notorious B.I.G. He's got a song called Who Shot Ya? And they like turn it down. He's like, no, turn it up. And of course, you know, if you go listen to that song, Who Shot You? Notorious B.I.G., he basically says in there, even though he denied it and said it was written before that happened, that was the first shot. He basically, because he had already, Tupac had already figured out he was set up. Then he's in prison for something he didn't do. And while he's in prison going out in the yard, he hears, Notorious B.I.G., who he helped become a rapper, let him sleep on his couch and gave him money and stuff and took care of him when he was homeless, come and let him rap at his shows, totally made his whole career. And now here he is with a song where basically, I mean, you can't help but think when you listen to those lyrics, it's talking about anybody else but Tupac. And it's all about who shot you and all this and the rest of it. And so, the you know, an old lifer brother that's been in, you know, a life, you know, life sentence brother in there because that's who they put him in there with. You know, tells him, oh, you don't know that was written about you, blah, 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 or whatever. And he's like, you know, let it go, let it go, son. You know, you got to let it go. And he says something about, he does, he says something about Haitian Jack, but he doesn't call him Haitian Jack. He just says something about that one guy you're running with or something. I, I, again, they go out of their way in this movie to include information that, that includes connecting Haitian Jack to all this, but they go out of their way to make sure that it's very confusing of who they're talking about. That's done, that, that's done with intent because the old lifer brother says, he does, he says something like, um, well, that one nigga you hanging out with or has, or that one brother you hanging out with had him foot, his foot on them hip hop niggas for years. And, uh, that's who he's talking about. He's talking about Haitian Jack. So supposedly Haitian Jack was like a, a hip hop manager and all this stuff. And there's, there's, it's amazing when you uh, start looking into Haitian Jack and you find out really how little there is on him. And how uh, I was talking about scrubbed information the other day. How much stuff has been scrubbed on this guy? And uh, supposedly, he had been uh, basically extorting using extortion tactics against uh, Bad Boy Entertainment with Puffy and Notorious B.I.G., he had been using extortion tactics against them, which then led 
to basically him blackmailing them into doing the Who Shot You song and perpetuating this idea of East Coast, West Coast warfare going on between rappers and gangs and all the rest of it. Again, till Haitian Jack comes on the scene, you really, you know, yes, they had tried to get him, but here comes a guy, as soon as he's with this guy, he first gets, you know, accused of rape and, and sodomy and the rest of it, and then once they realize he's not going to do any hard time on it, he sends the same guys, Haitian Jack's guys, go over there and shoot him five times. So the whole, as I was talking about the last show, the whole East Coast, West Coast thing, that was being perpetuated by people within the, the CIA and within these different forces that were, that were connected to these individuals in order to set up this narrative that would allow them to neutralize people like Tupac that they consider to be a threat. Now, that's what's interesting. Again, <coughs> as I said, um, <coughs> there, the people that research this stuff up to the point, you know, and connect the stuff with him being murdered. All that stuff is valid and true just as, just as well. But once you start looking at, you know, all the evidence, especially all the stuff that happened that night uh, at the MGM at the Tyson fight and, you know, all these guys from the LA, LAPD that have been, were involved, the Rampart scandal were there and caught on tape and they were involved in that. I mean, absolutely. As I said before in the last show, um, uh, Shug Knight most definitely knew about the plan to kill Tupac, but he let he never let on to those guys that he wasn't for the plan. He acted like he was all about it and then got war. That's why they got him put in prison immediately and implicated him immediately in that fight at the MGM Grand with Orlando Anderson, who they, in fact, planted there to make all that happen. And were, they were concocting the narrative all the way across the board. Now, why were they doing this, and why were these former Compton police officers and and LAPD officers involved in the Rampart scandal? What would they have? Why would they try to kill Tupac, and why would this Haitian Jack guy try to initiate East Coast, West Coast stuff? Again, these people are all, in the end, working for the same people. Haitian Jack, uh, the the dirty LAPD and Compton police cops, these people are all working for the, and it all, again, traces back to that, to the CIA-controlled drug trade. And this is why now I believe the, the Tupac stuff warrants at least a mention in Spellcasters 2 because it's unbelievable how much I've uncovered on that subject. And it connects across, I've, I can connect that for you uh, uh, across the 70s, 80s, and then 90s with Tupac. And there's a lot of it ties in. It ties in with Black Sabbath and the whole, and with Black Sabbath in the 70s, Randy Rhodes, the death of Randy Rhodes. Uh, many of you are probably going, what? How does that tie into the whole cocaine thing? It does. I've got the evidence. I've got the proof. I'll be presenting that in the film. And then in the 90s, in the 80s, it, w- it was with rock. And that's the thing is, 70s and 80s, you had big rock, major rock bands and major acts in both the country music world and the rock world. And you also had this in the 80s. That were... Um, basically front organizations for the distribution of cocaine and other illegal drugs and because it was the f- perfect cover. Many uh, country music stars, Waylon Jennings comes to mind as one that was involved in that. Um, and then I've dis- I, uh, inadvertently discovered connections of the whole cocaine trafficking thing connected to the CIA, connected to the death of Randy Rhodes. And, um, and then that also connects into the CMP and the Contra stuff. Uh, you just wouldn't believe it. And then, of course, with the Tupac thing. Tupac became started becoming aware of, you know, he, the guy had, he had, the, he had a 40, the, the FBI kept a 40,000 page, uh, 40, uh, 4,000, 40,000, 40,000 page file on Tupac constantly. They had been, the guy had been watched, followed, and monitored since his birth. Because his mother was pregnant with him when she was in prison um, for stuff involved, for her involvement with the Black Panthers. And so right after she got out of prison, she represented herself and got off on the case. She had Tupac. So um, 
they were expecting him to sort of be the, you know, bringing back the new Panthers. And in fact, there was a thing where he talked about bringing back the Panthers. But when you look into the new Black Panthers, which I don't believe that he had anything to do with, although he could have, what's interesting is the, the, the new Black Panthers are absolutely CIA controlled. And CIA, I've had run ins with them before here 10 or 11 years ago, but I used to go to anti, anti war protests and participate in those for 9 11 Truth events here in Dallas. And, uh, trying to talk to some of those uh, cats a few times. And boy, I, if I ever have gotten spook vibes from somebody, it was them. They didn't have any knowledge about any issues, didn't act like they gave a fuck about any issues. They were just there to uh, observe other protesters going on and report back. That was clear. I didn't know anything about their involvement. And of course, they were the New Black Panthers were actually founded here, right here in Dallas. So the people that I was actually talking to and interacting to, unbeknownst to me at the time, were actually like upper upper echelons. So those guys were definitely CIA spooks, and I had no idea because I didn't know anything about that stuff at that time. 2006, 2007, I didn't know anything about it. So once it became apparent, everybody knew that there, you know, there was drug activity, gang activity, there was Crips, Bloods, LA, former LAPDs, all within... Uh, Suge Knight's record label, Death Row Records. But, and that's the thing, people don't forget that, that Tupac was only on Death Row Records for like nine months. He signed a three-record deal and recorded all of his, he did a double record and then the Machiavelli record, so that was three records sold. He did all that in a very short amount of time. But from, you know, all the stuff that happened to him, and he was constantly, and he was on the search for knowledge, and then being in jail, and his brothers telling him about the Illuminati. Tupac was one of the few people that was in the know of the, uh, the corrupt cops' involvement and all that involvement, and the involvement of, uh, again, David Kenner. He's the guy who was the lawyer for Suge Knight and Death Row. He's the other CIA connected individual. He's the guy's name I gave you, David Kenner. And Haitian Jack are two of the most important names to research in all of this. Because those are the guys that had the connections to the super powerful people. He's the one, David Kenner's the guy that got, um, that's another one, he got Snoop Dogg off on, remember Snoop Dogg's murder rap? He's the guy that got him off on that when it was clear he was guilty. I mean, everybody even knew he was guilty, but he got him off. So they had started to become uh, the people who were involved in the record label, the other artists, Tupac and uh, Snoop and all the rest of them. You know, they, there was, everybody had started to have knowledge of what was going on. But after he fulfilled his three, de his three record deal with, uh, with Suge and Death Row, Tupac de decided that he wanted to go start his own label. And he wanted to make films and, and uh, you know, kind of start going a completely different route and be independent on his route. And Suge made it pretty much known to him, you, you can't leave. All your, yeah, you've got a car and you got this, but it's all tied up in this record label. So you basically, you can't leave. And in the movie, they show him, like, offering him Death Row East records. That was just something they came, that, that's total bullshit. Tupac was never going to go to the East Coast and run, uh, Death Row East in lieu of him doing his own fucking record label. That, that's horseshit. Once David Kenner and then later Haitian Jack, once these, these characters started getting word that Tupac wanted to leave sort of what you, could, you would consider or call the, uh, the circle of knowledge. And, you know, it's like... Um, You know, it's like people who have security clearances. They retire, but they, you know, even though they're retired, they can't talk about anything that, you know, they saw back during the time when they had a security clearance. So, because nobody else from that circle at that time that knew anything about this CIA-connected drug trade and how ensconced it was with the death row record label at that time. Um, that's when they started. That's when they were like, okay, well, Tupac's a threat because 
he had basically he you know, he had seen a lot and he knew a lot at that point. Not really that he, because he was involved in it or anything, but just because of you know being tight with Suge and and being around the stuff and the idea of him being as such a big star <clears throat> as he became and being out there with that knowledge that connected, you know, that's where these supposed hip hop moguls were getting all their power from. It wasn't just because they were selling records and rap. No, 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 no. This is why you started to see them pushing rap as sort of the predominant music and pushing other forms of music out of the way. That's one of the reasons, another reason why they wanted to kill Kurt Cobain. The power that Kurt Cobain and the voice that he had and the ability to affect the in, and influence so many people was dangerous to the power structure that couldn't control what he was going to say. Same thing with Tupac. That's why when they killed Kurt Cobain, you quickly saw the music industry start to take a downturn and quickly any music with any sort of validity started to get pushed on the back burner and all of a sudden they started pushing out all of these second and third watered down generation grunge bands, nickel, the Nickelbacks and all that crap. And the same thing when you look at the supposed death of, of, of Tupac. It went from, I mean, listen to Tupac, some of Tupac's stuff, man. Nobody had the flow, the lyrical ability, the cadence, just the emotional. That's, that's the thing about me with music. It has to be, I have to feel it. You know, that's the biggest thing. If you look at, if I look at all the bands that I like, I like it because the person who is singing is sing is doing it with convincing emotion. The, the emotion is so real that you feel it. I mean, there's stuff I, I listen to. I can hear of Tupac's today, and it's still it's like, oh, it's fucking hard, dude. You're just like, oh my god, that shit, that shit is hard. Twenty two years fucking later, but that that's that's what it was. It was that you know the delivery that that thing that just that only strictly comes from your soul and from you could just you know you just hear it. When it comes through, and um, and it's just what you you know you just don't get that from this other hip hop and all this other stuff that came after it. I mean, you just that's it's that convincing emotion that you just you know you that you just don't get anyway. It's in the same way again. You saw all that music became clown music. You know, most of the majority of hip hop is clown music. I mean, there's there there's some I like, you know, but they weren't going to let anybody have that kind of that kind of a power anymore. So, um, the the thing about this case, the reason why it's still relevant is because uh, many of the people involved with it, um, a lot of them have been killed, but a lot of the guys that were you know, like, I mean, Haitian Jack and, um, what's his name, David Kenner, I mean, they're, you know, they're still alive and in business. And they seem to be the main two guys that were, that had really initiated a lot of this stuff. I mean, they're still trying to, you know, they're still, they're still trying to take Suge Knight down. But there's a lot there's a lot of stuff going on right now with with this case and a lot of stuff that's going to come out um, over the coming months that's going to expose a lot of a lot of this stuff and a lot of the questions we've had for a long time is a lot of stuff's going to come out um, and there are, you know there's still people thinking that he's going to come back at some point especially with all you know all the the you know the Machiavelli stuff and the the being crucified stuff and the references to that and the whole you know, of the, the Machiavelli I was talking earlier about the, uh, the Kill Illuminati. It's called Kill Illuminati, the seven-day theory. Lots of sevens. Lots of sevens. I mean, think about that. You know, if he's killed in Vegas, you know, hey, think about the lucky sevens. Lots of sevens connected to Tupac death. I mean, the seven-day theory, I mean, he, 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 you know, was, he was shot. And then he survived for seven days until he supposedly passed away on the 13th of September, 2000 and, uh, not 2000, uh, 1996. Um, so hey, you have that. And I mean, there's tons, there's, there's, there's sevens out the way and you get to there and add it up. He was 25, five and two, seven. I mean, you could just go on and on with it. But he was definitely making those references, and uh, 
again, the, the stuff, going back and listening to it, here's what's fascinating. I talked about the Beatles in the fall thing, and I talked about how both in the, in the Beatles music and in the guy who the original Paul went on to, to be, who everybody's still clamoring to find out. You'll find out. Don't worry. You'll find out in Spellcasters too. He also had these backwards recorded messages and stuff in, in all of his music referencing that. And guess what? Tupac's no different. There's tons of clues and tons of backward stuff in there. So, you know, when you start to look at that and you see these references, I mean, he was making references and putting backwards references to stuff. Even on the uh, on the Machiavelli album, there's a little, at the, the very first song on the album, I think it's Bomb First, I think is the name of it. The very first word you hear when you put on the Machiavelli album, you have to turn it up real loud to hear it, and it says it quick, but you can hear it. The first thing you hear when you crank up that album is you hear, Suge shot me. You hear a voice say, Suge shot me. Clear, not playing it backwards or anything. It's clear playing it forwards you hear it. Go listen to the song Bomb First by Tupac on YouTube. And right at the very beginning, you hear like a piano thing, and like it just starts, it's like a piano thing, and the first thing you hear is some guy goes, Suge shot me. And then... I mean, there's been tons of stuff. It's kind of like, I'm still alive. I think that was in one of his recordings or something that came out. And I mean, there was, and then the hints about they're going to, you know. And he even talked about, it. there's tons of interviews where you can hear Tupac talking about saying, you know, he's saying that, that uh, it, it, anyway, he, he just gave, he gave every indicator. If you really listen to it, listen to the interviews and listen to what he said, he really gave a lot of indicators People just take it as as like he was just saying, "Oh, well, they're going to, you know, I'm a gangster. They're going to, you know, they're going to kill me or whatever." But if you actually listen to it, he actually multiple times says, "You know, um, I'm not. I, I don't. Ha- he's he, people are, have quoted him as saying that. You know, I need to get in here and get the studio because I'm not. I, I, I'm not going to be here much longer." He was basically telling people he was on the way out, just short, even short within the days and couple of weeks before his death. I forget who it was. Somebody played him something that he was on and it wasn't f- finished yet or something. And he said, man, that's good. I hope I get to, uh, I hope I'm, I get to hear it again sometime or someday or something. Basically like, you know, hinting that he wasn't going to be around much longer, but the, uh, again, many of the people that were involved, I mean, can you imagine, can you imagine well, you want to talk about shaking the fucking the core of? Uh, I mean, because he said he was going to do it. I don't know, man. Can you imagine though if, if Tupac actually came back? Ooh, ooh, dude, there would be some shit set on fire. And again, a lot of the people that were involved in that are still powerful and still out there, which is probably why he hasn't made his uh, appearance known. But I found it interesting, you know, when. Barack Obama opened up Cuba. And then, of course, Trump now talking about how he wants to he wants to close it off again. I just, you know, just thinking about that. In terms of uh, I'll tell you one video I saw that I actually do believe is real from examining it. Um, One of uh, the many. (laughs) One of the many famous women that Tupac had sex with that put his dick in was uh, was Madonna, actually. Yeah, he banged Madonna. What a pimp. Uh, not that that was hard back in those days either. I mean, if you pretty much showed a dick to Madonna in the 90s, you could fuck her. I mean, you just show her a dick. She's on it like fucking white on rice. But um, they actually were friends and stuff too. So uh, Madonna, a couple of years ago for her birthday, went to vi- to visit Cuba after it opened up. And there's there's video footage, man. I mean, there's a lot of fake ones, a lot of fake stuff, and you know, different footage that says, "Oh, it's you know." There was one footage I saw. It was like Tupac coming out of a recording studio. It was like, "Look, he's still alive," and it was somebody going, "Look, man, look, that's Tupac." It was fucking DMX, motherfucker. Come on, right knows what DMX. It was fucking DMX, and this dude was fronting like it was, you know, Tupac. So there's is that kind of fake bullshit out there, but there are other ones that I think are legitimate. There are there's other pictures of him and there's you know there's a guy that's been there was actually strangely enough there was a luke radowski we are change video 
this is bizarre beyond anything, especially when in terms of you look at who what I've exposed with um, the spellcasters and the phony patriots and the you know and the whole the whole phony stuff connected to Jones the CIA stuff. There is actually this blew me away. There's like a Luke Radowski we are change clip or something. Um, I saw this on YouTube. Some Tupac truther guy has uh, had, had put together. It's pretty nuts, dude. There's a guy that walks by in like a yellow raincoat. And you kind of see him out of the frame with the light. Like, he knows that he's on camera, and he's, like, putting on a show. And he does, there was this little kind of, I don't know if they had a name for it. I don't know what he called it. I don't, it, was, it was the ghetto or something. I don't know. He had, there was some kind of little dance that Tupac used to do. And you see of the frame, the last frame, you can see this guy, like, Luke Radowski's, like, talking on camera or something. And there's, like, this, you can see this guy, come, black guy coming from the back in a yellow raincoat. I don't know who caught this originally or, or you know, kind of eagle eye caught this, but when you look at it, man, it does make you think. You can see this guy come behind Luke Radowski's in a yellow ring, and motherfucker, I mean, he looks like fucking Tupac. And when they kind of are moving the camera around, you kind of see him go out of frame, and he dances by and does the exact little dance that Tupac used to do out of frame as he's walking by. I mean, stuff like that I've seen, there's something to that. Again, there are fake ones out there, and there are fake videos, but the Madonna one where, like, she's dancing with a guy in Cuba at, like, a, you know, on her birthday in, like, a, a restaurant or something, man, you know, it's kind of from a ways back when you get really zoom in and close look at it. I mean, you got to think Tupac would be, like, 45, 46 years old. Wait, I'm 41. He was born in 71. So, yeah, he'd be more like 46, 47, right? So... Um, and this guy looks like he's probably about that age too. You know, black don't crack either. Those, those black guys, I've seen, uh, guys, that, you know, 65, 70 years old, black guys, that, you know, they look fucking 35, 40, but there, I mean, there's, I, there's a lot of legitimate stuff that points in the direction, especially again with his aunt, you know, that was in the black Panthers, uh, escaping there in 1984, so there's definitely a lot that ties into it, but again, the reason why this has relevance is because I've connected the music industry and the suspicious musicians' deaths to the CIA illegal drug trade. And if I had to venture a guess, because I've been asked a lot about this recently, um, if I had to venture a guess, based on what I've, I've, I've seen in research with all this stuff, I think that the most recent deaths of Chris Cornell and Chester Bennington, in my opinion, in my gut feeling, I don't have all the data and evidence to back this up right now. I freely admit that. But in my opinion, their deaths had something to do with that, too. Um, I, all that poor shit about, I mean, I, you know, my, my theory, in my opinion, is just as valid as, as the fucking stupid theory people are saying about them exposing, you know, these fucking uh, pedophile rings or some shit. There's no evidence that supports that whatsoever. But I have evidence across multiple decades connecting the deaths of musicians and suspicious deaths of musicians and you know, assassinations and whatever, whether it be Tupac or whether it be Randy Rhodes or whoever. I mean, I've got this across multiple decades connecting back to the CIA and the illegal drug trade and how musicians and artists and, and touring artists, I mean, think about it. You're touring, you're in every city, perfect distribution routes. I mean, I've got this information going back to the CIA, back to the 60s, back to the Grateful Dead. You know, talk about Kurt Cobain. Guess who was involved in that? Courtney Love's dad. Courtney Love's dad was the go-between between between the CIA and the Grateful Dead that was providing the CIA to the Grateful Dead that they would then distribute out on their concert tours. Uh, Again, you know, this is what I'm trying to put together. This is the work I'm trying to do and put all this together for the spellcaster. So, you know, if you don't think that this uh, fucking fall stuff applies to you, or you don't think this Tupac stuff applies to you, you know, you need to understand and wrap your mind around what I'm trying to present here. This is not fucking Little League, okay? I've been in this a long time. I'm not playing fucking Little League anymore. I'm playing fucking hardball. And what I'm trying to put together are real massive research uh, efforts that at the end will give us more answers than we have right now. 
And I'm telling you right now, I bet the farm on anything that Chester Bennington and uh, Chris Cornell and maybe some other ones, their deaths are directly uh, tied to the knowledge of this illegal drug industry that's connected to the CIA and, and the music industry. Period, point blank. So for all you haters and all you people that wonder why I've talked about the fall, the fall stuff, all that stuff connects into it too. I, I, it's, you, don't, you can't even wrap your fucking mind around why this is important. All the haters and the people, oh, he's talk, talking about Tupac, oh, he's talking about fall, oh, it doesn't have anything to do with it. No, you're just too uninformed and too, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Yeah, just too small-minded to understand the importance of it, but that's okay. I'm not making this, I don't make these movies and do this work for, for you people anyway. I make it for the people that really get it and really want the truth and are willing to put their money and their lives in their mouth is where their mouth is for this truth, like I am. I mean, look at my body of work. Look at my films. Go to my download shop and download my films and look at my body of work. I'm not in this to fuck around or, you know, to be some half-ass internet star like some of these other cocksuckers out here. I want the truth, and I'm going to get the truth. And let me tell you something. I've gotten a lot closer to it in a lot of my work than a lot of other people have, and that's just F-A-C-T fact. So even though you, Mo, you may, you may listen to my show that you never contribute or donate anything to and wonder why I'm talking to these topics and these shit talk me and leave comments on YouTube or send emails, you just can't wrap your mind around why it's important. That's not my fault. That's not our other listeners' fault. But all will be revealed. And, uh, yeah, I think, I, I think this spellcaster is too undoubtedly... I mean, it's just no question. And again, I never thought it would be at the outset of it, but it definitely, definitely, this whole spellcaster thing, all of it, one and two, one point five. I mean, it really is. Didn't think it would be at the time. It's turned out to be the the most important work I've ever done because there's all this into it with all this misunderstanding. You know, people are happy to talk about these different conspiracies, whether it be Fall or Tupac or whatever it may be, all day long, but they never give you the reasons why you should give a fuck about it. And I know that's not people's fault, but I mean, again, this is part of the ongoing cover-up. And we're not just trying to get to the truth here. We're also trying to expose these people who are covering this stuff up. Phony truthers, you know, whoever, Alex Jones, whoever it may be. All of them. Um, Again, this is our fundraising week. We have less than 48 hours to raise the rest of our operating cost goal that we need it hasn't moved a bit this we haven't even had a trickle and we've got to reach we got less than 48 hours to reach 100 percent, folks so we need everybody out there come together and pitch it in go to the globalreality.com if you want to visit the uh download shop or use the donate button if you don't want to use a paypal account if you want to use the uh fundraising uh pages you can find those here in the comments and in the read more section of the youtube video here as well as on our Facebook social networking sites, uh, the Global Reality Radio Network Facebook page and the Josh Reeves Filmmaker Radio Host Explorer page. If you have not liked us over there, please go and do that and add us, and you'll find all of our uh, fundraising banners with all our goals, 10-year anniversary, when all that stuff is there. But uh, we've got uh, you know less than 48 hours now. We need to go ahead and get some of this stuff coming in because we've got to reach 100% of our operating cost goal by three o'clock on Friday and we don't have any grace period because of the holidays and stuff. So everybody that contributes a hundred bucks, will get your name or a name of your choice in the special thanks credits of spellcasters volume two, as well as three free downloads from the download shop and uh, a download of spellcasters two upon its release. And you'll also be entered into a grand prize drawing. And as usual, the largest amount contributor will receive a grand prize, um, somewhere in the neighborhood equal of their contribution. So let's do it. Let's make it happen, folks. Again, it may not always appear to you, because I don't want to give too much away when I'm putting together these films, you know. There's a lot of stuff I can't give away because there's stuff that I've discovered that's going to be in Spillcasters too that 
again, nobody's gone on to yet. So I'm not going to get up here and talk about it on my show and let everybody and their mother rip it off and make a million YouTube videos about it before I even get a chance to get my movie done. But again, rest assured, I'm not here to fuck around. So if you hear me talking about Tupac or, or hear me talking about Fall or whatever it may be, let me tell you and let me make you understand yet again. There is a very serious reason why I'm talking about these things, whether you can see it or understand what it is or not. Okay? I guess I wasn't clear about that previously. That was my fault. I won't let it happen again. All right. Peace out. We'll see you next time. Take care.